goal that we're trying to, to build here, and that's to get more youth um, up here on stage. And I know that I have had some friends who have come up here and served for some of the services, whether it's through singing or performing with different instruments. But he has, he expressed, Pastor Dave said, we haven't had a lot of youth come up here and actually give the message, you know, Saturday morning. And uh, so when Pastor Dave had ori originally reached out, I'll start off on an honest foot, I was a little bit, I was a little bit uh, skeptic about it. I wasn't sure. You know, I got spring break next week. I got midterms coming up. I was honestly, I didn't know if I was going to have time this week to prepare a message and nevertheless have time to really like think through my words and know what I was going to say. Um, but by God's grace, we're up here. He provided that time this week. And, you know, I'm overall, I am just thankful for the opportunity to be up here and uh, speak with this Hamilton Community Church. And, you know, our message this morning kind of covers the topic of three young people who not only stay faithful in a time when they really don't have to be because it is hard to be faithful in their situation, but they are also tempted to forget who their father is, and they remain faithful, never forgetting who their heavenly uh, father is. And it's kind of a coincidence that this is kind of the theme we're going along, is these young people standing up for their faith and never forgetting who their father is, is because there's a famous, very famous story in my family of one of our kids kind of forgetting who their father was. And uh, originally when we were living in Atlanta when I was younger, the spot when we were living, for every single birthday that you had or every kind of after school party as a kid, whatever it was, it was Chuck E. Cheese. Like that, that was the spot that you would go for as a kid when we were living down there in Atlanta. And there's this one day, my older sister Sophia and my dad, he had taken my older sister to Chuck E. Cheese. And when you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you walk in and they kind of give you a stamp on your hand to try to like let you know like you paid to be here, you have a right, you know. Uh, to be here. And so me and my, my older sister and my dad, they walk in, they get their stamps, they're there for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Time goes by. And then my dad and my sister are walking out. And as they're walking out, my, my sister realizes that, you know, the stamp that she had in her hand, it wasn't there anymore. It had kind of faded off. And so there's a teenage, uh, like, desk worker there at the Chuck E. Cheese, and she kind of, she sees that my older sister didn't have a stamp. And so she's thinking, oh, maybe she didn't pay to get in. And what makes it a lot worse is at the time, my older sister had, like, bright red hair, and my dad had silk uh, black hair. So they looked nothing alike. And so this teenage worker, she looks, oh, this young girl does not have a stamp. She's with this older gentleman that looks nothing like her. And she goes and she asks my younger sister, hey, do you know this man that you're with? And a normal response would be, yeah, that's my dad. She goes and says, I have no idea who this man is. <laughs> not only does she not know who this man is, now it's a teenage desk worker freaking out because she's like, okay, this could be something serious and they look nothing alike. So she asks her again, is this your father? Do you know who this is? And she says, no. And so my dad, now he's worried because he, for some reason, didn't bring any ID with him. It's all back in the car. And now the teenage desk worker, she goes and gets the manager of the Chuck E. Cheese. He has to be brought out. He starts questioning uh, my dad, like, is this, like, what's going on, sir? You don't look alike. You have no family photos. You have no ID. And she's saying you're not her father three times. So this is a pretty serious situation. And eventually, they, my dad was able to go back to the car and get some kind of ID or family photos, and they figured it all out. But for the time being, my sister had forgotten who her father was. And my dad's expectations that, her, that his daughter would remember him, were, uh, they were not fulfilled. And the reason I tell you guys this story is because it transi transitions us into what we will be talking about uh, this morning. But before that, let's go ahead and start with the word of prayer. Um, dear God, I just want to praise and thank you once again for another Sabbath day. Uh, I just want to uh, welcome everyone here that's listening in person and all our online viewers and just safe travels for everyone. I want to pray a special prayer of safe travels for Pastor Dave, where he is at, and just another beautiful Sabbath day to uh, talk about your good word, Lord. In your name, amen. So as I said earlier, I'm a freshman at Southern Adventist University, but about two or three years ago, in between my sophomore and junior year of high school, I was a part of a canvassing program up in Nashville, Tennessee. And for those of you who don't know what canvassing is, canvassing is, if you know some Christian literature, different Christian books, it's pretty much door-to-door -door sales, and we're going door-to-door -door selling these different Christian books and kind of health and cookbooks. 
And when you're canvassing, there's two type of areas that you, that you canvass. One is like a regular neighborhood, right? You're gonna have one person on this side of the street and then another person on this side of the street and you're knocking on door to door trying to sell these books. Then there's another part of canvassing where you're gonna be in like a business strip mall and you go into the businesses and start canvassing the people that are inside of it. Even like skyscrapers, you'll go into those if you're in a bigger city. And so most people like doing the neighborhoods, but I love doing the business strip malls, but more specifically, the Walmart or Target parking lots. And the reason I love the Target and Walmart parking lots so much because it was a gold mine for some reason. I don't know why, but every time I had my highest book day or the most books sold, it was in one of these parking lots. And there's this one day in specific, I'm in this Walmart parking lot and I can see from a distance, there's this, this older lady and she is pushing, I mean, we talking like two full carts of groceries. So I walk up to her and I'm like, hey, ma'am, you know, do you need help with your groceries at all? I was, you know, just trying to, you know, ease her up a little bit before I start my canvas. And so I'm talking to her and she's like, yeah, I would really appreciate some help. And so I start putting the groceries into the trunk of her car. So I'm putting the groceries into her car, and as I'm doing this, I'm thinking to myself, I'm really going the extra mile for this lady. I was like, I really could have just gone up and gave the same sales pitch I give to everybody else, but I'm helping her put her groceries in her car. I'm doing the most right now. I was like, I'm getting the book out. Like, I'm expecting to get, maybe not even one, I might get two. I was expecting to get some kind of money out of this, and in all honesty, I felt like I had the right, rightfully so, to think that, because I felt like I was going an extra mile for this lady. So I get to the last grocery, I put it into her, in the trunk of her car, and as I put the last grocery in the car, I start doing my canvas again. And as I'm canvassing, she cuts me off immediately and says, look, right now I'm really not interested and I just don't got the time, gets in her car and drives off. And so I'm stuck there in this Walmart parking lot, just kind of like disappointed because I was expecting to get a book after doing all this work, work and, and putting these groceries in her car, and I was left with nothing. And I was sitting just kind of disappointed because I had these expectations that were not met. And just like in the story we talked about earlier with my dad, he rightfully so was expecting his daughter to claim him as her father, but his expectations were not met either. And so we find ourselves a lot of times where we put expectations on different situations or even people, and a lot of times they are not met and we are left disappointed. And in these times when we feel disappointed, the Bible actually tells us how to get through these times. And a very quick spoiler, it's actually the title of our sermon, um, Even If. It takes the type of even if faith. And so I'm going to be starting our message this morning in Daniel chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with me or with you, you're welcome to turn, uh, turn to Daniel chapter 3 with me. Again, Daniel chapter 3. So starting in verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the perfect governors, advisors, treasurers, officials to come up to the dedication of the image he had set up. And so the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all other kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And so we see here in the first six verses right here in Daniel chapter 3, we have this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he sets up this giant gold statue and he gets all his high-ranking officials and, and all these people that are high up in, in his kingdom. And he says, well, we're going to announce this to everybody in the land and uh, everybody in the nation that when these instruments start playing, everybody is commanded to bow down and worship this statue I've built. It's a famous story most of us probably know, right? And he does this and he says, not only if they don't do it or they disobey my commands, they're going to be put into a blazing furnace and be burned alive. And so then we continue in verse 7. It says, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and other kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came for, 
award and denounce the Jews. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all other kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Jews whom you have set apart of the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty, that neither, neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. And furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all other kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, worship it you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, and I want you guys to really like listen to these last two verses because they really emphasize the point we're getting at this morning. And so verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Then verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And so we see here in Daniel chapter 3, it's like the setup of this even if faith that we're going to learn about a little more later on. But we see Daniel and his friends, they are face to face with not only death, they're face to face with being burned alive. And it's not just that. Daniel and his friends at this point, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had set up a level of respect and authority in King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, right? He, they had had somewhat of a good relationship with him. And not only are they willing to throw all of that away to die, they're willing to throw all away the authority they had and the respect that they had earned just so they could be burned alive. And without any kind of context, I'm going to be honest, that sounds insane and not probably the smartest thing you could do. But we see that they had this even in faith saying, look, King Nebuchadnezzar, we know that our God is able to deliver us from this situation. We know that we can, we can live and to see tomorrow even if you put us in this fiery furnace. But guess what? Even if he doesn't and even if we end up being burned alive and we are dead, we're still not going to worship and, and fall into your temptations. We're still going to be faithful and trusting in our God. And so this is the type of even if faith we're talking about when we're saying getting through disappointing or difficult times and when we have expectations for the future. These is even if faith. And so we know we need to have it, but how do we get it? And we learn how we get this in an earlier chapter in Daniel, and it's Daniel chapter 1. And for those of you who don't know Daniel chapter 1, it's another famous story that we have, but it's when King Nebuchadnezzar he goes into Jerusalem and he takes, not only does he take a, a group of just young people and young men, he wants from the most noble and royal families the best looking, the most fit, the, the smartest young men he can find. And some of those young men happen to be Daniel and his friends. And so Daniel and his friends go from living a lavish lifestyle, living with a royal house and a noble lifestyle, to a brand new land that they're not used to, to a king who's telling them to do all these things that they don't want to do and know they're not supposed to do. And as soon as they get there, they're already faced with the first challenge, and this is that the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, wants them to eat and drink certain things they know they're not supposed to eat and drink. And so Daniel and his friends, they're like, I'll be honest, if I was Daniel, I would probably battle a little bit with God, saying, honestly, like, God, is it that big of a deal for this one time? You just let me, you know, get away with this, because I just got to this new land. I don't really want to create problems with the king. You know, I really don't want to start off on the wrong foot. And so Daniel doesn't do that. Daniel and his friends, they stay faithful no matter what. And even when the king is asking them to, uh, you know, eat and drink these things they know they're not supposed to, they don't try to go back and forth with God. They just ask, yo, give us 10 days and we'll, we'll eat our diet and, and we'll eat and drink the things that we know we're supposed to drink and we'll see who's healthier at the end of 10 days. And if you don't know the story, they come out looking healthier, smarter, stronger, really all of the above. 
And so Daniel and his friends, we see how they get this, even a type of faith, is from the very beginning, when it is something as small as a diet, they are faithful and trusting in God. When God gives them a responsibility or a challenge as small as just a diet, they are faithful, so then God can reward them with more responsibility and honor and authority later on because he knows that they will respect it and they know that he knows that they will be able to deal with it. So when they're face to face with death and being put into a blazing furnace, they're able to be faithful in the greater of things. And you know, there are a lot of times in our life we kind of tell God, like, you know, we're going through, maybe it's a challenging time or whatever it may be, but like, God, I don't really need you right now. I have enough faith and trust in my own ability and my own (laughs) knowledge and, and I have enough faith in me, I don't need your help. And quite honestly, this thing I'm going through is really not that big of a deal, so I don't even want your help. I know I can do it on my own. Or we, we have this opportunity and we're like, God, I don't really want your help because I know if I, if I ask for your help, you're going to ask me to do things that I'm probably not going to want to do. And I'm, really, I'm trusting enough in my own ability to why I don't need you. And we think that these smaller things and these smaller challenges in our life that we don't need to be faithful to God and that we don't need to be trusting in him aren't a big deal. But we see in Daniel they really are. Because how can we expect ourselves, if we're not faithful in the smallest of things, to be faithful in the larger of things and the larger of challenges that we face later on in life? And the Bible kind of talks about this and takes it on. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 16, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so we see here in Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 16, we see that God is saying, whoever, it's quite simple, and I, we can read the first line again, whoever can be trusted with very little also can be trusted with much. If God can't trust you with a small challenge and a small res- responsibility, how do you expect him to bless you with a big responsibility in your life? And a lot of times we're very quick to ask God for things like, oh, I want this much money when I grow up, I want this, I want this job, I want this leadership role, I want all of these things. But yet we don't understand, and, and I might be the first to tell a lot of you it, uh, tell a lot of you guys this, but you're probably not mentally ready to have those kind of things that you're asking God for. Having the money sometimes that we ask God for, I want this much money when I grow up, I want to make this much money, that's a big responsibility that a lot of us are not mentally ready to take on and manage that kind of money. Or I want this kind of leadership role, I want this occupation when I grow up, or this job, like can you please give this to me, God? You're probably not ready to accept that role right now, and God knows it. Because it's so easy for us to be like, oh, well, when I get this role, when I get the job, or when I get this thing I'm asking for you from God, I will be faithful to you then, and I'll give you all the glory and honor, all these things. I just want this one thing. But when we have these smaller challenges and smaller responsibility that God puts in our life, we're not faithful to him in it because we don't see it as a big deal. But how do you expect yourself to take on large responsibilities if you can't be faithful in the smallest of things? And we see Daniel and his friends living this out from prayer to being face-to-face with death. And we, it's not just in Daniel that we see this. You know, we see it later on in Daniel chapter 6 um, <clears throat> with the famous story of Daniel and the lion's den. You know, he's told, you know, by the king of that time, like, you can't pray, you can't worship your God in these ways. And he's told these different things he can't do. And what is the first thing that Daniel goes and does? He prays about it. And, and not only does he pray about it, he prays about it in public. And he's told that if he does pray about it and disobey the commands that were given to him, he'll be put into a lion's den. And when we know the rest of the story, Daniel prays, he's put into the lion's den and makes it out alive. But you see, Daniel was faithful from the smallest thing from a prayer and praying to when, when he was face to face with, face to face with hungry lions in a lion's den, he had no problem trusting God because he trusted God when he was as simple as a prayer. And the same thing with the diet, as simple as a diet to where he was able to, to be trusting with him when he was face to face with a fiery furnace. When God gave him a small responsibility, he made the most of it and stayed faithful so God could bless him with a larger responsibility because he knew he could take it. And we even see it not just with Daniel, but in the story of Job. Well, Job has everything in the world you could imagine, a beautiful wife, all the money in the world, all the friends you could ask for, all the land. And even when he had all these things, he was still faithful to God in every single part of it. To when every single thing was taken away from him, he still had this even if faith. As in, God, even if you take away all these things from my life, I'm still going to trust in you and serve you. It's not an only if faith to where, God, only if you give me these things, I'm going to have faith in you. 
No, it's an even if, God, even if you take these things and everything is not going the exact way I want it to, I'm still going to serve you and have faith in you because I know you have a plan. And as I tell this story, I'm going to keep some names just anonymous out of respect for them. But uh, a couple years ago, one of my good friends of mine, we had another friend who was not doing very well. And he was pretty much, he was on life support. And so we were told the exact time of day that they were going to take him off of life support if they didn't see any kind of like signs of life, right? And me and my friend <clears throat> were working at this time. And as it's getting a couple minutes before what we were told, he would be taken off of life support. I pull him aside and I ask him, do you want to pray about this? He's like, yeah, like I would actually really, you know, appreciate that. And so we start praying. And as we're praying, I, I'm thinking of like what to say to really calm the situation down because it's a very serious situation. And I think of this story in Daniel. And in the prayer, I say, God, like you know what's going on. And in all honesty, you have the power to where if, we, if you want our friend to be live and healthy tomorrow morning, you could make that happen. But God, even if you don't let that happen and we don't get to see our friend tomorrow morning, even if you don't um, save him in this way, we're still gonna be faithful to you. And if, in all honesty, we're probably gonna need a little bit more faith moving forward because the difficult times are coming. God, even if we don't get to see our friend tomorrow, we're still gonna have faith in you and trust in you. And this is the exact story I used in this prayer with my friend. And whether you are atheist or Christian, you are going to face challenges and problems every single day of your life. And you're going to want things as well, asking God all the time, oh, give me this and give me that. But yet we can't be faithful with these smaller responsibilities that God gives us. And whether, like I said, you're atheist or Christian, you're going to face problems. And time and time after again, we're going to try to trust in ourselves that we can handle it with our own ability and our own well-doing and our own knowledge and wisdom. And honestly, you can't do it by yourself. And we try to put God to the side in these smaller things because we think we can handle it on our own when we really can't. So then when we're faced with bigger challenges and obstacles in our life, we do not have the faith to stay trusting in God at all because we weren't faithful in the small things. And you know, ever since I was a kid, there was a Bible verse that was told to me, and I remember all the time, uh, every single day to this day. It's in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. And it says, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And so we see here in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, it's a verse that I would, you know, assume most of us know. Uh, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move this mountain from here to there. And in all honesty, a lot of times, even in my own life, it feels like I have this faith the size of a mustard seed. And instead of this mountain moving from here to there, it feels like another mountain is added on top of it. It feels like it's just challenge and problem, and it just these things keep adding up. And you sit there disappointed because you have the expectation, because I have the faith of a mustard seed, this mountain and every problem in my life is just going to move out the way. But in all honesty, our expectations, expectations are not going to be met in that situation. And you sit there disappointed because we're, we have the faith of a mustard seed, but problems keep occurring over and over again in our life. And maybe your problem is similar, uh, your situation is similar to my story, as in you have a family member or a friend, whoever maybe may be, they're sick, they're not well, right? And you're a little stressed out about it, and you have a problem trying to trust God in that situation. Like, I don't see God in this situation because my family or friend or whatever it is, they may be, they're sick. And it's hard to trust in you right now, God. Or maybe it's you're dealing with relationship, family problems, or you're dealing with, it could be divorce in your home, financial crisis in your own home. There's so many problems that can happen in this world, and it's so easy to look towards our own ability as in how can I solve this and not even think about how God can solve it. And it's so easy when we think we have this faith the size of a mustard seed to try to tackle these obstacles and challenges on our, uh, by ourselves with our own, our own faith and our own ability and own doing that we kind of put God to the side. But we know in all honesty we can't do it without him. And like I said, whether you're atheist or Christian, you'll face these problems. And when you don't have that even if faith and you don't have that even if faith that 
even if these things don't go my way, and even if God does not rescue me, and even if everything in my life is not the way I want it to be, and even if I don't get this job I want, or even if God has a different plan for my life than I intended to have, even if these things do happen, I'm still gonna remain faithful and trusting in God, because his plan is a lot greater and a lot more accomplishing than what I have set for me. And as we end the message this morning, I want to read one last verse, and it is Psalms chapter 71, verse 14. And as we end the message this morning, I want you to really take in what we're saying in this last verse. And it says, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. And I feel like that first sentence, as for me, I will always have hope, that word hope can be interchangeable with the word faith. As for me, I will always have faith. Even in the darkest of times, even in the greatest of times, like we talked about with the story of Job, even if everything is taken away from me, I'm still going to remain faithful and trusting in you, Lord. It's like we said, it's not an only if faith. God, only if you give me these certain things I want, only if you give me everything that I ask you for, only if every little thing in my life is perfect, then I'll have faith and trust in you. It's not an only if faith, it's an even if. Even if these things don't go my way, I'm still going to believe in you and have trust and faith in you. And so as we end the message this morning, just keep that in mind, to always have that even if faith, even when it doesn't seem like it's very doable to keep it. Let's go ahead and bow our heads uh, to end the, the message this morning. Dear God, I just want to praise and thank you once again for um, all the people that were able to come out. Um, I just want to thank you for all of our uh, listeners and viewers online and all of our people that are here in person. Um, I want to pray a special prayer um, again on Pastor Dave and his safe travels and just everyone else here that, you know, took the time to come to church today. And again, I want to pray a special prayer um, upon everyone that's listening that they may have this even if type of faith, even when it is hard, even when it is, you know, uneasy to keep this faith with you, Lord, that they may still remain faithful and trusting and knowing that you have plans and great plans for their life, Lord. So I thank you once again and pray for the health and well-being of everybody listening, whether here in person or online. And just thank you once again for a great Sabbath day. In your name, amen. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, You can be confident of one thing, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Jesus Christ returns. Here at Hamilton, we exist to connect the disconnected by sharing Jesus through loving and serving and being a grace-filled church family. When you walk through our doors, we want you to feel right at home. It's our intention to make worship attractive and Christ irresistible. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, welcome to Children's Church. Good morning, welcome to Hamilton. Our service is about to start. Come join us now. It's time to worship.